The following is an analysis, interpretation, and summary of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. The last chapter of my Atomic Habits analysis and summary, chapter 20, the downside of habits. Yes, they can be downsides to something so potentially beneficial. In the last chapter, we talked about how to stay motivated in life and work, how to stay focused when you get bored, the idea of boredom, the importance of consistency and and managing expectations and reality to maximize the success and sustainability of habits. Now, the last chapter, the downside of habits, beliefs, making adjustments, and the conclusion, the secret, as James Clear talks about, to long-lasting results. We're going to go through that right now in this last chapter. So, if this is the first video you've seen, I've done a whole playlist. There are 20 other videos on Atomic Habits. The playlist is on YouTube, podcast platforms. You can see all that. Written summaries on alexanderemmanuel.com. But, all links below. For now, let's finish off. As habits become automatic, you can become less sensitive to feedback and can fall into mindless repetition and stop thinking how to do it better. They can lock us in a rigid pattern to thinking and acting. That's what habits can do. You can just get in such a habitual loop, you know, of like weighing your food every day or like stepping on the scales or reading the book or walking outside. You're just like in this loop of mindless repetition and you got to ask yourself, is this still of value to me that I meditate every day, that, that I stretch for this long, doing these movements every day? You know, could there be refinement to be had? Habits are necessary, but not sufficient for mastery. You need automatic habits plus deliberate practice. You can have a habit, but it's not, it's not just the, the, the habit itself. It's the quality of the habit. It's deliberate practice, which is very important, which is this idea of when you do something, you want full attentional focus on it. You don't necessarily always want to be going through the motions, like just shot after shot. All right, listening, you were distracted. It's like, no, more about shorter duration Hyperfocus can be very valuable on learning a new task of like I'm learning that new skill, right? Learning those new, uh, learning those new chords on the instrument, rather than slow, distracted learning where you're going like hours on end. Sustaining an effort is the most important thing for any enterprise. The way to be successful is learn how to do things right, then do them the same way. Every time, that's Pat Riley, NBA, old ex-NBA coach. But the important thing is you want to learn how to do things right. You need to set up the foundation of doing the habit effectively first. Because you could do something poorly and execute it over and over again and call it a good habit. But really, it may not be. If your execution of the habit is flawed, then you are refining a flawed execution, flawed technique. I've done this before. I know many people do. You have to stop and think, where did you learn this from? Did you learn it from a professional, from an expert, from someone who you trust? Or did you just kind of look it up on the internet and you're just doing whatever? (sighs) The solution for not slipping into complacency is establishing a system for review and reflection. This is very important. This is what I do routinely. Every month I have a review reflection system uh, and I have a yearly one. You know, because life just passes you by and the older you get, the faster time is perceived because every year unit time point is relatively uh, smaller compared to your existence on this planet. For example, if you're two years old, one half of your life has gone from zero to one. Like one year feels like half of your life. Oh my God, half, when you're 10 years old, one year is a 10th of your life. When you're 100 years old, one year is a one hundredth of your life. And so the, as you age older, it feels faster and faster because the time point gets smaller and smaller relatively. And so as it gets faster, it becomes ever more important to have some type of system of monthly and yearly review. I would highly recommend people look up Leo Babauta monthly uh, or yearly review and with uh, look up Tim Ferriss as well. Okay, I've adapted their system into my own. It's one of the best things I've done. To just pause and be like, oh, look at all the things that happened in this month, the lessons I learned. Develop a system for reflection. If you care about going through this life with a bit of purpose and you care about, you know, taking a moment a month just to see if the path you're on is 
the, the path that you should continue to go on because at the end of the line, five years down the track, you might've been done something and you'd be like, why am I still doing this? Well, if you did your reflection, you might've stopped it a while ago, saved some time and done something you more productive for, your, for yourself. How to break the beliefs that hold you back. In the beginning, repeating a habit forms your identity. As you latch onto that identity, those same beliefs can hold you back through dogma and conditioning. We see this often with nutrition ideologies. People attach their habit of eating a certain way or exercise regimes or a religion. They form the habit over and over again as part of their identity. And this can make you dogmatic. And when working against you, your identity creates a pride that encourages you to deny your weak spots and prevents you from growing. The more deeply a habit, idea, opinion is tied to our identity, the more strongly we tend to defend it when it's criticized. This is very, we have to be very careful about tying our identity and ideas to, to our habits or to our opinions. I'm not my opinions. I'm not my food choices, my exercise choices, that those are just my habits that sit in accessory to my identity. Who I am is more important than what I do, but they are not the same. But most people get them confused. Oh, you're a lawyer? You're a doctor? You're an you're a environmental activist? Your social media handle? Is it your name? Or is it something you're trying to represent? Now we've muddled the two. Now we've muddled identity and opinion. And identity and belief. You are not your beliefs. You are your values. You are your identity. Who are you? And we talked about this in previous chapters in identifying that. Your character, characteristics, your character traits, the big five. The harder we cling on to an identity, the harder it is to grow beyond it. And one solution is to not allow any one single aspect of your identity to make up an overwhelming proportion of who you are. The more you let a single belief define you, the less likely you are to be capable of adapting when life challenges you. What if you're wrong? What if you're wrong, plant-based MD? What if you're wrong, carnivore-based MD? What if you're wrong, multi-level marketing scheme, at multi-level marketing scheme? What, what, like, what if you're wrong, at Jesus is king? I disagree with everyone who doesn't think so. Like, what if you're wrong? Earth is flat. What if you're wrong? And you, like, it's fine to hold the, any of those beliefs. It's not the belief or opinion itself. It's what happens when we latch onto it and we defend it like it's an, it's an armoring and someone's trying to harm us every time we, they challenge us or they ask about it or they share their own counter perspective. If you tie up everything about who you are into being the lawyer or the athlete or the musician or the artist or the military personnel, then that, the loss of that facet of your life, when you lose it, it'll wreck you when it's gone. And it wrecked me when I solely identified as a basketball athlete. Who am I? What is my purpose in this world? I am more than the sport the thing I dedicated myself to. And it took some time to realize that. You know, we see this commonly with, like, with athletes retiring from, like, you know, you thought, I, I think I thought was, like, a challenge. Like, think about if you make it professionally and you now have the confirmation of millions of people who, I, who now, I, they identify you as an athlete. They see you as the guy or girl who's the best at their sport. And you have to transition out of it. And they have little to transition to because they're only focused on one part of themselves. This is why you see some of the, the greatest sportsmen and women, they have other things. Look at LeBron, look at the Kobe's, look at the Dwayne Wade's. I reference basketball a lot, it's my world I know. But if you look at some of these guys and girls, like look at even some fighters. You know, you saw George St. Pierre, he, he's... He, the, whether you own a gym yourself or you go back into you go into coaching or whether you get into things like acting or music if you're an athlete and get seriously injured your career ends you may have an identity crisis on your hands a lot of people going through identity crisis in the last two years when they could no longer do their job because their job was made essentially redundant 
can't go into work. What do you do now? Who are you? Oh, you're more than your job. You're more than the thing, the nine to five. Even though you spend the majority of your time doing it, it's not who you are. Like you're more than that. If you're a, a vegan or a carnivore, or like you get a health condition that forces you to change your diet, you might have an identity crisis on your hands as well. See, when you cling too tightly onto one thing, you become fragile. You lose that one thing and then you lose yourself. When you spend most of your life defining yourself one way and that changes or disappears, who are you now? If you spend every waking moment working your business, how will you feel if you lose or sell the company? Your purpose and identity, is it gone? You don't have to pick up the pieces and re rebuild yourself and realize that you are not the thing that you do. The key to mitigating these losses of identity is to redefine yourself such that you get to keep important aspects of your identity, even if your role changes. So you want to focus your identity centering around characteristics and value traits instead of occupations and titles and ideologies. I'm an athlete. Well, how can we change that? I'm the type of person who is mentally strong, who needs to seek a challenge within a team setting to get the most out of myself. Oh, suddenly you don't need to seek that. You don't need to be an athlete to do any of that. To seek challenge, to work in a team setting, get the most out of yourself. There are so many opportunities to, to do that. I'm a soldier. I'm a SEAL. I'm a veteran. I'm, let's replace that. I'm the type of person who is disciplined, loyal, patriotic, adaptable. And I seek discomfort through high stakes, complex problem solving. Hmm. High stakes problem complex. Uh, high stakes complex problem solving. Business. There's a lot of business opportunities that could that could be high stakes prob complex problem solving. High stakes uh, could be medical fields. Could be intellectual fields. Could be uh, economics. I'm a businessman, CEO, entrepreneur. Replace with, I'm the type of person who relishes building things from scratch, nurturing them, giving them the opportunity to other people to flourish in an uplifting environment. You just want to build things? Hell, you could grab the logo behind me and, and start building that, make a business from that. You see, your identity must be flexible, formless, adaptable, like water. Your identity works with and around the changing circumstances instead of against them. And the changing circumstances have never been more chaotic than particularly in the last two years in this 21st century. So what are you going to do? How are you going to be adaptable? Think about the occupation you do. Like, I'm a health coach, strength and conditioning coach, yoga teacher, teacher, business owner, podcaster. But if all those things disappeared, what do I have left? Who am I? I am a tenacious, ambitious, individual who thrives under the pursuit of a commitment to excellence in fields that spark my curiosity in an environment where I can work with people who are inspiring, uplifting, and equally as ambitious and conscientious as I am. Just made that up on the spot. I could I could sit and we could reflect and sit on these for like we could write about these for like quite a while. And you could find your amalgamation of your identity. And then you could Think about what fields, what opportunities, what games can I play in this life? What games can I create where it's the intersect of these different values? There's a quote by Lao Tzu. Men are born soft and supple, dead. They are stiff and hard. Plants are born tender and pliant, dead. They are brittle and dry. Thus, whoever is stiff and inflexible is a disciple of death. Whoever is soft and yielding is a disciple of life. The hard and stiff will be broken. The soft and supple will prevail. Who do you want to be? 
soft and pliable, flexible and adaptable, or stiff, hard, brittle, inflexible, and dead. Everything is impermanent, chaotic, in flux. Thus, you must continually reflect on today's habits and systems and determine if they are serving you in the ever-changing environment. A lack of self-awareness is poison. On a self-reflection or review is the antidote. However you find that reflection, whether it's a daily two-minute journal, Tim Ferriss has an amazing resources on this, particularly in his book, Tools for Titans. No, I won't be reviewing that. It's giant. I'm going to summarize a summary. <laughs> Crazy. That's a great resource. Leo Babauta's monthly reflection, Tim Ferriss' yearly reflection. Find whatever resource works for you. Hell, you could do voice journals in your phone. That's how I do my monthly review on occasion as well, while I'm doing other things, like walking, habit stacking. I used to attack, I, like one example I'll give you is that I used, to ha I used to meditate every single day. For years, I lost count. I think people like to, like, they like to brag, like, oh, I've meditated for 10 years, five years. I've done, like, I get it. Like, and I've had, I identify, like, with, the training part now like I've, I've i've trained every day for years i can't i don't even know how long like i, I don't know like f forever like f for a long ass time you know it doesn't whatever i try not to bring it up but i'll give, illustrate the point that's not going to be resourceful to me forever i identify as that type of person so there's going to be some friction when i if i want to change that or if i feel like like there's going to be friction there and understanding determining that's not going to be resourceful to me forever if i start a family like, I'm going to have to manipulate and change some of that. Maybe, you know? You know, once I hit some of the outcomes and I'm trying to achieve my physical and mental health, like, I'm going to get to a point where you don't need to have the same actions anymore. Cause, but I could, you could easily get get stuck in, the, like, the that mentality of, like, again, 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 forever. But, like, some things can take its place. Some things can ebb and flow. It's okay to not meditate every single day for the rest of your life and read every single day for the rest of your life, you know? And so that was me. I was I was doing some meditation every single morning. And I was, it was becoming a rigid routine. And the journaling and the, and the, the gratitude practice, when they, they all served me in a lot of ways. But it was becoming a long, redundant practice. And, and while it, it had its value... You know, once I got into a new environment with this with this new home, you know, I was able to reset some of those habits and, and find myself do, doing not doing them was was OK. Like I was fine. Like, oh, some of the residual effects from years of gratitude practice and years of uh, meditation, mindfulness practice, I, I build that into my day. And then I'm okay and I'm not spazzing out and I'm still able to stay mentally calm for the most part. And in fact, instead of a 10, 15 minute dose, I'm able to just, if I just do a, a one minute dose or a 30 second dose of some mindful breathing, I'm able to get very similar benefits to that long period of time. And so soft, supple or inflexible and rigid, the habits that serve you now will not always serve you. Just because they make sense on a piece of paper, scientifically, philosophically, does not mean that they should be continued con consistently. The last point, conclusion, the secret to long-lasting results. Like death by a thousand cuts, the holy grail of changing one's life is not single 1% improvement, but 1,000 of them. Dozens and hundreds of atomic habits serve as the foundation of the operating system of your character. It's not one habit that's going to change your life. Probably. The death by a thousand cuts. It's going to be dozens of small incremental habits over months and years which build up and transform you into a person you could look back and you barely recognize yourself. You're applying one grain of sand every day to the scales. And with enough grains of sand added, the scales become tipped in your favor. And your life starts working for you. You start running downhill. Momentum is on your side. So perhaps success should not be the goal to reach or the finish line to cross, but a system to improve and a process to refine. 
Maybe that should be more of how we define success. If you're having trouble changing your habits, the problem is your system. And I would add your environment as well. And we talked about in depth and how changing and manipulating our environment and manipulating cues in the earlier chapters if you haven't seen them. Very important. I'm kind of summarizing the book right now. Let's continue. Bad habits repeat seldom because you don't realize or want to change. People have the information, but because you have no or an ineffective system and environment to change, you need to manipulate and toggle both in order to create a better environment for you to be successful and effective at creating the change that you want. This is a continuous process. There is no finish line or permanent solution. Improvement is about constant adaptation and innovation to stimulate change. And it is also about aligning your identity and building an awareness of your identity of who you are, what you want to be, and where you want to go. And if you don't know those answers to those questions, you've jumped on this video later on, go back in the earlier videos and watch this series because those questions are answered. The secret to getting results that last is to never stop making improvements. If you stop making improvements, you will plateau and eventually regress and detrain and degress. But you have to, are you okay with that? If you're okay with it, that's okay. But if you want to improve, you got to be consistent. You say you understand, but your actions contradict it. What could you do? Who could you become if you just don't stop? That's where I'm at now. I'm just not going to stop. I'm going to squeeze as much as I can out of this lemon. Let's see what the hell I'm capable of. Let's see what, let's see what excellence really looks like. Small habits don't add up. They compound. That's the power of atomic habits. And that's the conclusion to this 20 chapter book. Summary and analysis by me, Alexander Emmanuel Sandalis on atomic habits. James, if you're watching this by some small chance, I hope I have been able to solidify and add some thought-provoking commentary to the brilliant writing, human behavior lessons, psychology that you have articulated in this book. I really, I could not, I do not recommend this. This is one of my most recommended books as of now to clients, to other coaches, to just humans. If you're a human and you want to manipulate and change your behavior to live a better life, you should probably understand the operating system of how to effectively do that. And I think this book, and James does a v incredible job at it, at sort of finding the complex to the simple and making very practical strategies on how to implement that. I would love in the ideal world to be able to animate these series and, and make it even more interactive if the budget allowed for it in the future, perhaps. But for now, it's, we got audio, we got written on my website, alexandermanuel.com, and we have the videos here for everybody to interact with. I hope this series was valuable. And James, I hope I did you, then this book, the service that it deserved, because it has fundamentally changed me for the better. So thank you. I know a lot of people thank me. Well, I can't reply to all the comments. I see some of them every now and again. I don't look at them very much, but thank you for the words. I really don't think I deserve a lot of them because I think I'm just standing on the shoulders of giants and just adding my two cents and commentary on top. However, I've worked to get to this point and to challenge myself to be able to provide some thought-provoking, philosophical, psychological commentary. I hope it's been valuable. It definitely has for me. And this concludes the last chapter of Atomic Habits Summary Analysis. There's plenty of other books on this channel to dive into. Hundreds of hours of content, 48 Laws of Power, How to Influence and Influence People, 12 Rules for Life, and then Sapiens, a Brief History of Humankind, which should be done by now or nearly done. Playlists are all on YouTube, which you can see. And you can see snippets of these if maybe you're not as patient to watch everything. You can see highlight snippets on my Instagram, which is probably the best place to go, at Alexander Emanuel. 
or if I've mentioned it many a few times, at Strength of Saad, if you wanna see that side of my profession and vocation. And now for now, uh, it's gonna be, I don't know how long it'll be until I drop another video, but if you guys wanna stay tuned, email newsletter, we have all the links below. Stay subscribed, hit the notifications if you wanna know, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate the time, the attention, the patience, and the way you can thank me is by changing yourself and helping inspire the people and world around you to aim upwards and live a little bit more of a greater life towards their potential of who they could become. Thank you. I'll see you in the next one.